Hey, Adam Richardson, lead pastor at Sandhurst. We are so thankful that you have joined us here on this live stream on your device, and we have prayed that it would be an encouragement and a blessing to you on your journey. If you are a part of the local Sandhurst family, would you reach out to us and let us know who you are if you're unable to visit for any period of time, because we want to maintain our connection to you and our care for you. If you're outside the local Sandhurst family, then we welcome you here. Um, at the same time, we hope this will not replace, but only supplement the care and the teaching you receive from your leaders in your church. And if you would like to know more about starting or renewing a relationship with God through Christ, please definitely reach out to us at the number or the email below and we'll be in touch. If you enjoy this, would you please post or share this link so others can enjoy it as well. Thanks again for joining us. We trust it's an encouragement for you. Enjoy. Thank you all. Hal, I'd like to invite you to come on up. Hal Irvine was a pastor for a number of years. As you all may know, my week was kind of consumed and, um, <laughs> with a lot. And so uh, I turned to my brother Hal and asked if he would speak to us. And he will. Thank you, Hal. Thank you. I haven't preached for a long time, so I hope your crock pot's on low. <laughs> and, um, Karen and I moved here from a place called Estes Park, Colorado. Maybe some of you have been there. It's about 8,000 feet up in the Rockies. It's called the Gateway City to <clears throat> Rocky Mountain National Park, and because of its mountain environment, there are a lot of Christian organizations that have camps um, very close to Estes Park. And I, I am a firm believer that the greatest camp in the universe is called Wind River Ranch. And uh, go home and bring it up on your computer, book a family week, and go stay there. One of the things that Wind River Ranch started to do during the War on Terror was um, hold uh, wounded warrior camps, or we call them healing heroes camps. <clears throat> and I had the privilege, just because of my Army background, to, um, to, to go, and I, I think I did 14 or 15 weeks up there um, preaching. And one week I was there, and um, I... I had a guy come up and he saw my jump wing tattoos and he told me he had gone to jump school and then he said he was in the Navy. And I'm like, not many Navy guys go to jump school, except for the SEALs and when they're there we all go arf, arf. Um, <laughs> but anyways, th this guy was high speed. He was Navy EOD which stands for Explosive Ordnance Detachment. And the reason he went to jump school is because he was one of the most high-speed EOD people that the Navy had, and sometimes he would be jumping where vehicles could not go in order to defuse um, roadside bombs. And we talked about that, and um, you know, he said it was a, a scary profession, but he was a strong believer, and we ended up talking, and he actually um, was getting ready to enroll in Southwest Baptist Seminary. When he was talking to me about EODs, he said that the scary thing is not necessarily just the first one that blows up. He said the thing that can be even more threatening is that the terrorists were getting very good at what they could do, and they, they would actually link secondary explosions to the first one. And they had to be very, very careful because it wasn't just enough to acknowledge, yeah, the first one is there, all right, let's go. And he talked about working his way through and finding secondary explosions and making sure that those could be diffused. Brothers and sisters, I want you to know, I come to you this morning with a pastor's heart. I'm not on staff. I'm not one of the elders. 
I'm a brother in Christ. I have a burden. I have a text, and I have the Lord. And I want to share what's on my heart this morning. We've just heard some hard news. And some of us were here Thursday night, and in, in a sense, there has been uh, an explosion or there is an outburst of emotion. There is one of our staff who has resigned. There are outside forces. And I, rem- I was sitting in the back Thursday night when Adam came up and first made his announcement. I literally watched one lady's head just, bam, the concussion. But I'd like to take you to a text this morning that talks about diffusing secondary things that can flare up. Because in a hundred years of pastoral work, I can tell you this, that when something like this happens, the enemy wants to come in and start to make secondary things rise up and go this way. We have an enemy. He is real. His name is Satan. He hates God. He hates the Son of God. He hates the Bride of Christ, which is the church. And if you're here and a believer in Jesus Christ, he hates you. Be encouraged. (laughs) That's the truth. The Scripture says that he's a deceiver, he's a conniver, and he, he comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. But the good news is this, that whatever leash God has given to the enemy, it's just enough to hang himself when we as believers keep our hearts, our minds, and our souls tethered to God and his word. And that's the truth. And this morning, I'd like you to take your Bible or take your phone and go to Joshua chapter 22. We want to think through this question this morning. How do we diffuse secondary threats? Joshua chapter 22. And while you're turning there, let me give us a little bit of context. For those of you who are my age and older, you'll remember that Charlton Heston led the people out of Israel, right? (laughs) Moses takes the people out of Israel. They sin against the Lord. He says you're going to spend 40 years in the desert for discipline. The 40 years are ended. Moses does not get to go into the land because of his sin of striking the rock instead of speaking to it. God says, go up on the, on the mountain and I'll show it to you. Joshua takes over and he leads the people into the promised land. But before they go into the promised land, there are two and a half tribes that said, we would like to stay on the east side of the river. And Moses says, okay, but here's the deal. You need to know this. When we cross the river, your armed men are going to take us across because you're going to fight with the rest of us to conquer the land. And that happens, and they spend seven years in combat taking the land. And they didn't have helicopters, and they didn't have artillery, It was ground fighting. It was close quarter combat. It was hard. And now they have conquered the land. And let's read Joshua chapter 22. Then Joshua summoned the Reubenites and the Gadites and the half-tribe of Manasseh. And for the rest of our time, let's just call them E, meaning East, 2.5. And said to them, you've kept all that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you. You've listened to my voice in all that I commanded you. You've not forsaken your brothers these many days to this day, but have kept the charge of the commandment of the Lord your God. And now the Lord your God has given rest to your brothers as he spoke to them. Therefore, turn now and go to your tents. Can you imagine the emotion that must have existed as these two and a half tribes, they're warriors. They'd been in combat seven years with these other guys. Some of them were limping home. 
Some of them were probably being carried home. Some of them were missing arms. Some of them were probably missing legs. Masses of them would have had scars. It had been a hard battle. And when you fight together, you get close. You get very close. And now these guys are going off. And Moses, excuse me, Joshua is sending them off with his blessing. And they have done an incredible job. And they have followed the Lord and kept their word. But then he gives them this charge, beginning at verse 5 through verse 9. And we find these words. He says, observe the commandment or observe the law. Then he says, love the Lord. He says, walk in his ways. He says, keep his commandments. He says, hold fast to him and serve him. And then they depart and they go. Look at verse 10. And when they came to the region of the Jordan, which is in the land of Canaan, the sons of Reuben and the sons of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh, built an altar there by the Jordan, a large altar in appearance. Boom. This is like a bomb going off. Why? Because if you read Deuteronomy, Moses is very clear. It says, the altar for sacrifice exists in Shiloh, and that's the only place that you are to go and sacrifice to the Lord your God. Verse 11, And the sons of Israel heard it and said, Behold, the sons of Reuben and the sons of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh have built an altar at the frontier of the land of Canaan in the region of the Jordan on the side belonging to the sons of Israel. And when the sons of Israel heard of it, the whole congregation of the sons of Israel gathered themselves at Shiloh to go up against them in war. I don't know how long it took to go from Shiloh to, where, to the east side. It wasn't a bad trip, maybe three or four days. We're not talking about a long period of time. Guys that you fought with, that you're bonded with, the same group, that Joshua has just said, you guys are absolutely stellar soldiers of the God of Israel, and your hearts are in the right place. And now there's an altar, and the nine and a half are ready to go against the two and a half in war. Boom. There's something that's very important in this text. Look at verse 11. And the sons of Israel heard it said. If you look at it in the Hebrew text, it says, And the sons of Israel heard said, heard said, heard said, heard said, heard said. And after heard said, we read these words, ready to go to war. We've just been admonished by our pastor to not gossip. Words can lead to war. Words can lead to war. And in a context of where we are this morning, some people know more, some people know less. And the temptation is always to want to talk. Brothers and sisters, if we hear these words, well, I heard... Put up the hands. Better yet, I heard, let's pray. Well, I heard, let's pray. Because words can lead to war. And the scripture is full of admonition to us as the people of God to watch our tongue and to watch what we say. And to be very careful, James says that the tongue has the power of life and death. We need to be very, very careful about what we say. There's another thing that is important. If you read in chapter 9 of Joshua, 
early in the conquest of the land, they got hoodwinked by a group of people called the Gibeonites. And they had, they'd had success at Jericho, they had had success at Ai. And so the Gibeonites knew they were coming for them, and they tricked the people of Israel, and particularly the leaders, and Joshua himself. It says, because they did not inquire of the Lord. They didn't take time to stop and see what God wanted. One of the things I like about this text is look at verse 12. I think they learned a lesson from Gibeon. When the sons, excuse me, verse 13, and the sons of Israel, doesn't say they went to war, it says, and the sons of Israel heard of it, the whole congregation of the sons of Israel gathered themselves at Shiloh, that's 12, sorry, went against them in war. Look at 13, then the sons of Israel sent to the sons of Reuben and the sons of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh into the land of Gilead. Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, a priest, a recognized spiritual leader among them, and with him 10 chiefs, one chief for each father's household from each of the tribes, And then it says that they came, verse 15, and they inquired of the people, what is is going on? And they, they confront them very, very directly. Look at verse 16. What is this unfaithful act which you've committed against the God of Israel, turning away from following the Lord this day by building yourselves an altar to rebel against the Lord this day? day. When they asked questions, they were direct. They didn't beat around the bush. You ever had somebody come and ask you a a question, and you can just tell they're too afraid to get to the main point? Wow, look at this, uh, look at this pile of rocks. Oh, you got any clue how they got there? I know the river floods sometimes, and, um, and the wind's pretty strong, too. Never seen one eight feet high. I wonder how that got there. There's none of that. I'm going directly to the issue. Why did you build this altar? Now, we're going to learn in just a few minutes that there's some correction that needed to happen. But the leaders were direct. The second thing that they said is this. You know, in verse 17 and 18, they say, we know you guys are on the east side of the Jordan, and if it's not good land, then come in and live with us. Verse 19, if however the land of your possession is unclean, then cross into the land of the possession of of the Lord where the Lord's tabernacle stands and take possession among us. This is what they're saying. We're willing to sacrifice. Come back and stay with us. If you don't like that, move back in on this side where the rest of us are and we will sacrifice. We will make room. We will do what is necessary in order for you to be the people that God has called us to be. And I want to say this to the leaders of our congregation, staff and, and elders and small group leaders. In situations like this, we need shepherds. We need you to be with us. We need you to be among us. We need you to listen to us. We need you to hear our hurts. We need you to hear our fears. We need you to be sacrificial. We we need you to be vulnerable. And and one of the things that I like so much about this text is that the leaders did what was right, regardless of any exterior pressure that was put upon them. When I was young and in my first church, I had one of the deacons say to me, Hal, do not 
ever lead out of fear of other people. Lead out of fear for God and God alone. And preach for an audience of one. And there could be a temptation in this situation right now that we find ourselves as a congregation to be pushed, molded, because there's outside forces as well. We need to pray for our leaders. Do you know who your elders are? Do you know their names? Do you know what they look like? Do you know what they do for a living? God calls upon us as his people to pray for our leaders and to pray that they will operate and make decisions and lead us and shepherd us not out of any other fears but the fear of God and God alone. There's a third thing in this text. Once the leaders confront the people, they respond back, the two and a half tribes. And this is what they say. Look at verse 22. The mighty one, God the Lord. And they repeat that. The mighty one, God the Lord. And that, that's covenant language. In the New Testament, we often hear these words. Verily, verily. Truly, truly, I say to you. This is an Old Testament version of, of that explanation. The mighty one, God the Lord. The mighty one, God the Lord. He knows and may Israel itself know. If it was in rebellion or if in an unfaithful act against the Lord, do not, <clears throat> do not thou save us this day. If we've done what you think we've done, then smoke us right now. And then they go on to say, we haven't built it for a burnt offering. Look at verse 24. Truly, we've done this out of concern for a reason, saying, in time to come, your sons may say to our sons, what have you to do with the Lord God of Israel? And if we continued to read through the text, we would find out that the E25 built this altar because there was a river between them and the rest of the people of God. And when their kids grew up, they wanted them to know that they were still a part of Israel. And that altar was to serve as a reminder of such. And for the, the nine and a half that were on the west side of the Jordan, when their kids grew up, the ones on the east side wanted those kids to know that they were family and that they were together. And the thing about this text is that they're not defensive about it at all. So when somebody comes with, with a question and they're confronted about this, it's not like, who are you to say that? Oh, get out of here, you're just upset. There's three, of, there's three or four other altars in the land. What's bugging you about this one? No, the response is out of humility and charity and concern for the unity of the people of God. And look what happens. Verse 30. So when Phinehas the priest and the leaders of the congregation, even the heads of the family of Israel who were with him, heard the words which the sons of Reuben and the sons of Gad and the sons of Manasseh spoke, it pleased them. And Phinehas the son of Eliezer the prince said to the sons of Reuben, the sons of Gad and the sons of Manasseh, today we know that the Lord is in our midst because you have not committed this unfaithful act against the Lord, and now you have delivered the sons of Israel from the hand of the Lord. How do we diffuse secondary threats? How do we not let the enemy take the past week that we've been through, worm in here among us, and make other things blow up? We live the gospel. 
We live the gospel. This text shares the gospel with us. Three things that make up the gospel that are in this text. And the first one is this, it's repentance. Where do we see repentance in this text? Phineas and the leaders. Why are you guys committing this sin against the Lord? What did we just read in verse 30? It pleased them. Repentance means to have a change of heart or a change of attitude, a change of mind, a change of will. The second thing that takes place in this text that is gospel is reconciliation. The nine and a half were ready to go to war against the two and a half. And then they come together. They're one again. Repentance, reconciliation. And the last thing is this, renewal. They knew that God was in their midst. Brothers and sisters, that's the gospel. We live the gospel. Christ has called us to repent of our sins and to turn and serve the living God. How do we get the energy to live like they did? It's by the gospel first grabbing our hearts. Repentance. And repentance isn't just something we do in order to come to Christ. It is a lifestyle that we continue to exercise after we come to Christ. I've had to do some repenting in my own heart. I think Adam's like Paul, PhDs and all this kind of stuff. You want to know what? I'm Peter. Speak first, think second. And when I hear about other things, other people being involved, man, I want to pony up and let's go have a little come-to-Jesus party. I need to repent. And I want you, I want to ask you, do you need to repent of anything this morning and all that's gone on? I'm asking that at three levels. I'm asking personally, I'm asking congregationally, and I'm asking as leaders, is there anything we need to repent of? We can do it. We just sang about freedom. There's no condemnation in Christ. And if God's calling us to repentance, then let's repent this morning. Reconciliation. Do God help us to not let this divide us, but to be reconciled to each other. Out of repentance flows reconciliation. That's the gospel, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. If any man is in Christ, they're a new creature. The old things have passed away. All things have become new. And then what does the text continue to say? That God was in Christ reconciling us to himself. And he has now given us the ministry of reconciliation. Third thing, renewal. We hear over and over again from this pulpit by our our regular preachers here, Behold, I am making all things new. The gospel is about renewal. And how do we know when renewal is taking place? It's when we can say, God is with us. He's among us. You want to know what? If you march out of here this morning and say, man, the worship band was hot. I think God wants something far more than that. If you want to march out of here this morning and say, man, that bald guy was boring. God bless you. He wants more than that. Renewal and healthy church happens when we leave this place and regardless of how good they are, regardless of how good this is, We know that God is in our midst. That's healthy church. In order for that to happen, God brings us to these times. And here's another encouraging thing. My wife has Parkinson's. She is is not real... um, she is not real good 
at me having sympathy about small things. And sometimes I'll... <laughs> I got to preach this Sunday. I don't have time to get ready. There's some stuff, and Adam Adam was called and asked me to preach. Nervous. This is my wife's counseling technique. Get over it. (laughs) Honest, Kirk. So if you've got somebody that has a need, come and see me. I'll give you her phone number. Really, really quick counseling sessions. Get over it. And I don't want to be facetious. But we need to learn to deal with this now because this is not the last time. That altar was constructed, and within 300 years, everybody had fallen away from God and they needed to repent. If you read the New Testament, every book that's written to a church except 1 Thessalonians is all about struggle. And there's contention and there's issues. And so, what is the call? The call is the gospel. Repentance, reconciliation, and renewal. And if you're visiting here this morning, we've just been going through a set of sermons about the DNA of of Sandhurst and one of them is that we embrace the mess do not leave from this place thinking that we are just content embracing the mess doesn't mean we live in it, it means we work through it for the glory of God and that's what we need to do Uh, um, I still have one minute Hey, I can say that. I'm the bass, I'm one of the bass players. <laughs> I, I work now as a chaplain at McLeod. And McLeod has a designated group of employees called transporters. And it's not the science fiction movies. They move people in beds, they move people in wheelchairs, they move people in the hospital. And this is a story about a transporter. This transporter came into a room and there was this elderly gentleman sitting on the side of the bed. He was completely dressed. She was enthusiastic and she she comes in and she says, all right, let's go. Let's get you discharged. You have to ride in this wheelchair to leave the hospital. He's like, no, you don't understand. I'm, I'm okay. I can walk. Oh, no, sir, you're gonna do it. She walks over, she lifts him up, puts him in the wheelchair, wheels him down the elevator, heading out to the front doors. Is there anybody else who's going to meet you here at the hospital? And he goes, yeah. Well, well, who is it? Well, it's my wife. Where is she? She's upstairs in the room in the bathroom changing out of her hospital gown. We don't want to rush to judgments. We don't want to rush to assessments. We want to take time. We want to investigate. We want to talk. We want God to purify our hearts and give us repentant hearts. We want to reconcile. And we want want God to renew everything that he is doing in us and through us so that we say with deep conviction, God is in our midst. Let's pray. And in the quietness of the moment, I'd like you to look at your own heart. Is there anything that you need to repent from this morning? Maybe stuff that's happened this week has just dredged stuff up. I don't know. Is there any repentance that needs to happen? Would you just cry out to the Lord and say, say, Lord, I turn this to you. I place it before you. I confess it. You have forgiven me. 
Help me to not pick it up again. There's a reconciliation that needs to take place. And none of this means one person's right and one person's wrong. It means an attitude that we're going to work together for the glory of God to resolve things. Is there anybody you need to reconcile with? I'd encourage you to to not leave this place before you do it. And then could all of us pray right now that God would use what has happened to renew us, to make us more dependent upon Him, to give us a greater commitment to Him, to His Lordship, to His Word, and to being a church that takes very seriously our desire that we would be known that God is with us. Lord, we humble ourselves before you this morning. You're God and we're not. And we need your help to be the people you want us to be. We surrender our hearts to you and ask that you would do the work you want to do first in us and then through us. Make us a repentant people. Make us a reconciling people. And Lord, make us people that are marked by renewal for our good, but even more, God, for your glory and so that people in Florence would know that Jesus is Lord. We pray in his name. And everybody said, Amen.